consists of a different set of phones. That's the only reliable definition of a weak bond that I know of. But unfortunately, uh, that fact is not recognised, and most textbooks talk about weak bond, and they only refer to about 40 odd words, four dozen or so words. When they do, they are really commenting on the fact that these words are so very common, so very frequently heard, and so very frequently used in their weak forms, that it sounds very strange for them not to be used in their weak forms. And therefore, they think of them, of them as the only weak form that they are. Weak forms of words occur constantly in the rest of British speech besides these four dozen words. But those are unimportant. They're unimportant because they are, in a sense, optional. They're used by a speaker in order to get over a word more quickly, to squeeze the word into a smaller space, because people are locked spaces in their speech, time groups in their speech, they are locked to uh, grammatical units. The rhythm of speech, and that's basically what this lecture, like the previous one, is about, is the way people adapt it with words. English speakers, as I've said before, do it on a huge scale, much more than any other language. They adapt words, squeeze bits out of words, uh, we talked about elision on Monday, squeeze bits out of words and so on, in order to fit them into a pattern of rhythmical effect that makes the grammar of what they're saying clear to the listener. So, we're going to concentrate not on the, word, the words, a vast number of words that have drop, say, a schwa in the middle. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you say general or general, usually that kind of thing. Uh, those weak forms uh, don't matter. But the four dozen words I'm going to talk about, and they are listed on the left-hand side of your other side. On the left-hand side, other side that is not demonstration. They're listed down the left-hand side, 44 words. Now, among the things to emphasize about this is that this is not about British English, just British English. It's about all forms of native speaker spoken English. And as I was saying on Monday, it's one of the things that unites us, that binds us together, and that makes the, the speech of any intelligent, educated person, whatever variety in which he speaks, we share this tendency to share this habit of, of using these words, and so it's, it's one of the unifying things of the very diverse forms of English you find throughout the world. Now I want to uh, explain it at best, explanation to give my demonstration to actual example. So first of all, I'm going to show you the extreme by uh, taking a couple of sentences, ordinary everyday sentences, right? and saying them without use of any weak forms. Speaking is a thirsty job. Right, here we are then, at the end of the second paragraph, you can see it in heavy type, full type. Here's this, this couple of sentences said without weak forms. But it will take more than an hour and a, and a half for me to go to town, go into town to get cash from our bank, so that they can have some money as quickly as possible Tell us what are they asking them to give them at the, at the least. Now that sounds absolutely dreadful to any native English speaker. Uh, it sounds very much like what a lot of non-native speakers do tend to sound like. But it sounds absolutely dreadful. It sounds like at best a machine talking. Because it has none of the adaptations we normally have. It would normally be spoken as, but it will take us more than an hour and a half for me uh, to go into town to get cash from our bank. So, so they could have some money as quickly as possible, tell us what are they asking, asking them to give them at the least. So that way, so many of those words are used as weak forms, and now it comes out naturally, the grammar is more apparent to the listener, and it cut, it's a more natural rhythm. Now, the next step in uh, demonstrating the problem is we to take a few extreme examples. I'm not saying that these are common things. They certainly exist as genuine ones. I call them the cautionary examples, but they should warn you about what how you can give a wrong impression if you fail to use a weak form that's appropriate. So here we have the first of these cautionary examples, and it, somebody is saying the 
present I am giving him is a painting that I shall have done by Christmas. That's the first way of saying it. Now I'm going to make just one small change in regard to use of wheat ball and say the sentence again. The present I'm giving him is a painting that I shall have done by Christmas. Now there's a very big difference between those two sentences. Perhaps I'd better say them again. Right? This is, this is the, the first one again. The present I'm giving him is a painting that I shall have done by Christmas. The second way, the present I'm giving him, giving him is a painting that I shall have done by Christmas. Now just by selecting the weak form versus the strong form, in one word in that, in that sentence, the speaker conveys a fundamental difference of meaning. All native speakers will realize that in the first case, the person who spoke was the painter. And they will all realize effortlessly that the person who spoke in the second reading was not the painter. Now what is the word that gives that away? What is the word that carries that message? It's, yes, it's the word have in I shall have done. Because if have is a main verb, it does not reduce. It stays as have in four. If it's a not a main verb, but an auxiliary verb, then I shall have, shall have, it reduces to of, and uh, the speaker makes the point perfectly clear just by that small adjustment. Okay? The second one, second example, uh, was suggested to me by reading in class a book that you all heard a bit of by now uh, by two of our former members of the UCL Venice Department, O'Connor and Arnold. In, in uh, the O'Connor and Arnold book, there's a, there are exchanges all the time. There are uh, what I call uh, uh, remarks and responses. The first remark, the first speaker said, these books are all. And then the second speaker said, two of them are all right. Or, the second speaker says, two of them are all right. Now, the difference between those two versions is simply a weak form difference, and it exactly reverses the meaning. In two of them are all right, the speaker agrees with the first person spoke. In the second, the second two of them are all right, he largely disagrees. Can you spot what is the word that's, that's conveying that message? Well, it's very easy, isn't it? It's the word are. If you say two of them are all right, then that's contradicting the person. Uh, if they're all right, they're not all. Two of them are all right. Two of them are good, if you like. So I disagree with you. We don't know how many books there are. There are ten, perhaps two are all right, the other eight aren't. But that's one way of putting it. Now the alternative answer, two of them are all right. Now I could, of course, make a slightly artificial pause at the word are. Two of them are all right. Or I, if I were writing this, I might have taken trouble to put a comma in after are. The fact is that two of them are, now we have a complete sentence in which are is the verb and the, the expression all right is just an adverbial addition modifying the main thing. So two of them are means I've read two of them and I agree with you. Okay. So that's again a negative versus positive, black versus white, conveyed simply by the choice of weak form or not. The third possible example is the speaker asks four questions. Ask four questions. I think almost all native speakers of English would hear that as meaning a new for four questions. And uh, so it would be misleading, wouldn't it? Of course, it's what uh, meant uh, to mean for questions, to speak up for questions. And when the word for is reduced to a weak form, and you notice there are five. Uh, prepositions, as for, from, of, and to on the, on the list of, of weak form words. When introduced as weak form, then it's just f. It's barely got a vowel if you can uh, say it has at all. And that vowel would be schwa, right? You can even detect just to say the, the, the sound f by itself, f, and you've got a very good version. So it's a complete reduction from four. Uh, a deep stronger case of that, if you like, is, is line four. I've only known it four weeks, but he's known it four months. Now, I could not imagine any native speaker uh, not taking that to be the numeral twice. Right? But, of course, the speaker who said it originally may have meant, uh, failing to use the weak form, but he may have meant to say, I've only known it for weeks, but he's known it for months. 
this is uh, uh, an, expre an expression in which somebody says that he's going, well, somebody may have intended to say he's going to fast with the week of two. Of two. If he intended to say that he's going to fast, then he's making a prediction about what reduction in the eating the person is being mentioned is going to make. He's going to eat less, he's going to fast. Fast is a verb meaning to go without food, to refrain from food. But uh, he's going too fast if the strong form is used, it could equally well be on. It, it sounds much more like somebody breaking the speed limit somewhere, right? So again, a massive difference of meaning between the two versions. And if you're one of those people who doesn't pay attention to weak form and use the strong forms too frequently, then you're constantly presenting the listener with the job of working that out. So, he's going too fast or he's going too fast. Number six, a similar one. I was 18 months before I, I uh, could walk. And by the way, in English we, we don't say a year and a half. We say 18 months, right? I was 18 months before I could walk. And the reply comes, I was too. Now, I was too might be uh, the EFL version of it. But if, it's, if it was meant to be, I was too, right? in other words, the word was meant to have a Greek form, I was too means I was two years old. Older than the first speaker said. But I was too, with the clear form of the word was, the strong form of the word was, I was too means I also. Too now, instead of being the numeral, will be taken to be uh, <coughs> the adverb also. I also was. 18 months. Okay. Next one, number seven. Which training taken? Two possible replies. The 2210, right, given in the 24 hour clock system, the 2210, meaning 10 minutes past 10 p.m. in the evening, uh, and the other, the 20 to 10. But of course, the EFL uh, learner so often uses B, the B type for both of them. So there's an ambiguity again uh, of uh, time of which this is a training for that one. Another portion of example number eight, bread and butter. This uh, reminds me of a story. I, I worked for many years teaching at the University of Leeds, and one of my students came in uh, one morning. Uh, well, a couple of them, they, they were um, a bit distressed about something. I asked them what they were talking about, and they said, well, he's just insulted our landlady. Right? So I, I spoke to him, how did you come to do it? Well, uh, we were having breakfast, and he asked for bread and butter. And the landlady, because he said the word and, and seemed to say it so prominently and clearly, seemed to be emphasizing bread and butter, uh, took it that he was hinting that she wasn't putting any butter on the bread already. She wasn't. Took it, took it rather badly. You see, bread and butter is a, a, a unit. It actually doesn't even mean, does it? Bread and butter doesn't mean a loaf of bread and a pack of butter, does it? It means a piece, a slice of bread on which butter has been spread. That's what bread and butter means. And if you don't say it that way, with the reduction of the and to just, mm, just a syllabic n, if, if syllabic, yes, uh, then you will not be using the, the form expected and you see then perhaps for some people do even emphasize the act in it. So bread and butter. Right? Uh, now my last example of the way things can go badly wrong in, in conveying meaning is number nine. And that's we have a curious usage in English with the, the demonstrative that. We we talk about if there's something we don't like. We refer to that, that John or that Jill, whatever it is, we can mention this person. And the fact that we call them that one shows disapproval, shows dislike. And so if a person said, I expect that John told them, then it's the John we both don't like, or the John I don't like, certainly. Whereas, of course, this would be, uh, if an EFL speaker said it, he fa failing to use the word that in the normal way to the spelling T-H-A-T for that is not always a demonstrative, it's very often a relative. And when it's a relative, then it must be all the t. So I 
expect that John told him is neutral. I expect that John told him sounds very offensive, very, very unpleasant. Now, my last cautionary example is uh, a, a, a comic one in a way, because it's, it's the kind of thing that a good student does who is over-enthusiastic. What you have to be careful about is, and very often I find when I talk at length about weak forms, it's a little bit of a re revelation to many people. They've hardly heard of it before. They've not given much emphasis in teaching. It's completely understanding, understandable that when people aren't teaching English in a foreign language, they begin, they will teach each word as they come to it, and uh, they won't discuss much how words vary in these rather subtle ways at the early stages. In other words, the very beginning, the first few weeks of learning English, you can't take account of weak form values very uh, notably. But anyway, some people learning about weak form, and learning how important, at least I think they are, then try very hard to make sure they use them. And of course they overdo it, don't they? They, they start making weak forms out of words like on and in, uh, and other prepositions that haven't got weak forms on, or very, very rarely have them. So uh, this is an example of somebody being too enthusiastic about using weak forms. And it says, father's bringing home submission for dinner. Now, the point about that is that we use the word some in uh, two senses. One sense is a quantity of, an amount of, like some money, some time. And it's always reduced to a minimum form, usually just a syllabic M, some. Uh, sometimes if there's a vowel following the next word, it'll be some with a schwa. But it's reduced to a very minimal form. Uh, when it's stressed, or when it's not stressed but important, then it's given a clear vowel sum, and it's cut. So what the person said originally was, father's bringing home some missionary for dinner. You use some in the sense of a certain one when you don't know the person's name, but it's, it's like saying some or other. And in this case, of course, if you, if you over it and chose to use a weak form, then you're bringing home a quantity of missionary. So I, that could only be said, couldn't it, in the cannibal world, bringing home a leg of missionary or an arm <laughs> to the cooking pot. So, there's some of us. <coughs> well, at the same time as dealing with these 44 words, I've counted them as, on this occasion, uh, I say they apply to all forms of English, not the last two, the ones with the weak forms of sir and saint, are mainly uh, used in, in England, rather than, or rather in Britain, rather than elsewhere. American certainly is much, or Irish or Scotland. Um, but they, they are, the rest of them are universal in the speaking world pretty well. Now, besides those, there are a number of words, not, not actually weak form words in terms of present day usage, because they are invariable words. And I've listed those down the right hand side of that page of the list of contracted spelling. <coughs> uh, these, some of them do have weak form, but they none of them needs to be given a weak form essentially. And, but they are, uh, they are stressable, as well as often occurring unstressed. But they're quite important words. And their origin is that they have been formed out of weak forms in the past. Today, I would not want to say there is any weak form of the word not, right? Because you can't use it freely on its own, reduced. It has to be not. But in the past, people have reduced it. And now we've recognized that what's happened is the word not in its reduced form, in its weakened form, has coalesced to the previous word, and then you've got the list of the 36 or so words that do that on the right hand side of that page. Um, now, apart from that then, um, I'm going on to, uh, I have much to say about contractions, they're not uh, uh, very important, except you must recognize they exist, and you must realize that they're the normal form, they're what people say. I very often hear from native English, from non-native speakers, from EFL learners, we are not, I am not, and so on. No native English speaker anywhere in the world would say, I, I am not, we are not, they are. They just don't speak like that, right? It sounds utterly abnormal to say that kind of thing. They, they've got a choice. 
cross. The others say, uh, we're not, and then we, they use the uh, auxiliary the pronoun verb uh, contraction, we're, uh, or they say we aren't, and they use the auxiliary um, negative contraction, aren't. But they would, would never say we are not making both are and not clear, strong in the same sense. Just a fact. And of course, the great thing to remember about all these things I'm talking about is their importance is that they occur so frequently. In ordinary conversation English, you cannot go more than five words without one of them being either a weak form or one of these contractions. One word in four, roughly, is either a weak form or a contraction. They're an enormous number relative to the occurrence of any other word. So because they occur so frequently, that's what makes them so important and makes a big difference when your English sounding natural or normal if you employ them and it's sounding permanently artificial if you constantly forget to use the weak forms that we do use. Anyway, um, I've got a comment here on the kind of rhythm produced if you have strong vowels in all syllables. And uh, as I say, it's a rattling sort of rhythm. In fact, I do I divide the types of language speaker into rattlers and pouncers. Rattlers uh, have very roughly the same sort of clarity of, of each uh, um, syllable they utter, but pouncers glide over two or three words at a time and pounce heavily on, on the word they're really interested in. That's the typical English manner. Germanic manner is to pounce on the important words. And I said just occasionally you can find something that sounds a bit rattly in English by accident, as it were. I give an example here in the second paragraph. He deposited a packet of cricket tickets in his jacket ticket pocket. Well, if you, if you say that, he deposited a packet of cricket in his jacket ticket pocket. It does sound a bit rattly, doesn't it? But it's, it's a very acceptable kind of English sentence. So, now, uh, any other examples? Well, uh, uh, there's a warning about uh, the failure to use the weak form of two in don't take it to heart. For the, the comment that we make when somebody's upset about something, you say don't worry too much about it, don't take it to heart. If you don't use the weak form there, you say don't take it to heart. And now you sound like an American, <laughs> really, because the Americans pronounce the word H-O-T hot as heart, don't they? So don't take it too hard. Sounds like somebody uh, carelessly starting to drink from a very hot cup of tea or something like that. Don't take it too hard. Yes. All right. um, another example for underlining the importance of, of uh, Greek forms is my example here from uh, a 1930 Broadway musical by George and Ira Gershwin called Girl Crazy. And in that they have a song that goes I'm bad my time, cause that's the kind of guy I'm. <laughs> and that, to the native English speaking world, is terribly funny. Hilariously funny. Why? Well, because nobody says that's the chap, kind of chap I'm. No. Always, the word weak forms, or rather contractions like I'm, cannot occur at the end of a sentence in that way. So you have to say that that's the sort of person I am. Right. Uh, finally, uh, to demonstrate these, I've given uh, some examples of sentences that uh, are very simple, ordinary, everyday sentences, but people hardly ever get them right. Okay? I'll read them to you if you like. Here we are then. There are a dozen of them. The ice has melted. When am I expected? What has happened? Or what's happened? I should have finished soon. How many had he had? That is a thing to bring down the best of EFL learners. Okay. How many of you have the subject that I rarely <coughs> find anybody, even though I've just said it several times to them, how many of you had, uh, they very rarely manage to say it in the authentic uh, native English way. Had he had a skin fall? What does it mean? What have we got? How long did he had it? Yes. That will do. Give them them. Uh, what did he had? Has had he had it all? Well, all of those contain uh, traps, if you like, that the people who are unwary will produce in a wrong 
before. Anybody courageous enough to want to try and say how many that he had? That's number nine, in a way that I might approve of. Anybody want to go? Okay, I don't understand you being good. Yeah. Well, yes. How many have you had? That's pretty good again. How many have you had? Uh, he didn't manage it the second time. Uh -huh. did he? Those who are with me in class will know that I never accept one correct answer of anything because I'm not, I've got a nasty, suspicious person. And if you can do it, really master the thing, you could do it more than once straight off. Right? But go and give him another go. <laughs> How many have you had? He's got one out of three right. At least I hope that was right. The first one was right. But, uh, no, he's only got one thing wrong with it, really. It, it's the first hat. He's putting an H in it. In other words, he's making it strong. It's how many are deep, many are deep. Not many. Hoodie, even, not, certainly not many have yet. But many are deep, the deep, the deep. How many have you had? How many have you had? That looks pretty good. Yeah. Anybody else want to go? <laughs> okay. Or any of the others? Want to volunteer? Show your your friends your uh, vicinity with these things. Okay, all right then. So uh, it's a simple topic. Uh, I've said just about all I want to say about it. The only thing I have to do otherwise is to, is to uh, address, draw your attention to the other sheet, and there you find the week form shortest. I've arranged them uh, logically rather than the other way, not alphabetically. Uh, by determiners, uh, words like the articles and so on, pronouns, you see there are a fair number of those, connective, words like and and but, prepositions, I say just five of those, so don't make up any more, uh, and the biggest category is words, isn't it? They're uh, auxiliary verbs, largely. And then I've listed the contractions for you on the other side. Now, uh, to finish with, well, I've got a little time now, I'm going to give you a demonstration of uh, what co what contributes to intelligibility in English. Now, my point about the weak forms is that you, by using them, you make the broken rhythmic reductions and make your sentence sound normal, uh, make it sound grammatically effective, and so you improve your intelligibility a great deal. But, uh, a lot of things are studied when people are dealing with uh, uh, English phonetics, English pronunciation, and quite a bit talked about intonation. You, know, you saw that uh, uh, Dr. Jenkins on Monday morning wasn't very enthusiastic about, English, about intonation as <coughs> being much used in international English anyway. Well, I don't think it's very much used. The melody element of it is very much used in uh, ordinary interchange anyway because it's so variable from one part of the English speaking world to another. Uh, they, for instance, in uh, Ireland, people go up at the end of statements. The rest of the world go down at the end of statements. You, you can find any sort of rule you want to set up for one kind of English broken by a proportion of the speakers uh, or a number of the speakers in another country and so on. So uh, it's a rather will-of-the-wisp subject to English intonation. Never been written on very satisfactory. It's well worth learning something about it, and you're getting a basic course in it here. Well worth because putting the tones in the right places is enormously important. Tonicity is sometimes important. Getting the tones in the right places. Which tones is not so frightening, not so worrying. Anyway, my first demonstration is to show you how very little importance in terms of intelligibility, comprehensibility, intonation is. In fact, I put it to you and hope to demonstrate that you can say quite a long English sentence with no intonation at all. In other words, one tone. If you've got no variation in tone, you haven't got any intonation. But I shall say this first sentence then on one tone only. Here it is. Even poor unfortunate monks and nuns in their holy monasteries and convents must surely get so terribly bored with singing the whole time at just one single pitch level that usually, if only at the very end of what they are singing, they make at least a very slight change of pitch. <laughs> Yeah. 
you know, we put 20 barrels in British English. Very rich, very extravagant group. Most languages manage on five, right? But uh, we got this rather unfortunately large number, but we're saddled with them, we can't throw them away. So, but we can, if need be, I, mean, I, I can demonstrate to you, you can understand when you spoke with only one vowel. Because if I just take the one vowel sound, uh, right? That's a sound. Uh, we use it as two phonemes, short for schwa and long for er, as in work and so on. Um, but if I just use that one vowel quality and leave the consonants all as they normally are, you, I think you'll understand pretty well what I'm going to read now, even if you're not following it on the, on the uh, page. Here's number two demonstration. It's perfectly possible for anybody to turn English and a very understandable minute for a considerable length of time with, with it causing much difficulty until those uh, listening to those listening to him, even though his mocking years are only a single whole quality. That was roughly understandable, wasn't it? And it used only one word. And of course I can start talking like it is. Uh, <laughs> in fact, I find that some accents have been sad as if they're doing all of that. The accents in the North, in England, I'm always reminded of when I convert to speaking on one bar. But I want to take it a bit further. But my point is, of course, that the bar is well worth getting a clear set of bar. But it's not the most important thing. But the reason you were understanding that was the rhythmical features were so clear. The rhythmical features told you so much that the vowels only tell you a small proportion more. Uh, right, now, here's the tough stuff. What about using not just one vowel but only one consonant? Because you've got 24 consonants, don't you? Know, <coughs> well, I can do that. And I've got several examples doing that. The first one, 3A, also used to know intonation, and then that's extreme. Even, uh, I don't, I would understand this uh, uh, if I heard it read straight. But here it is. <laughs> well, without any intonation, it doesn't make sense at all, does it? But, now, doing the same thing, but using the normal intonation, B, now, at that point, we've got something that quite a lot of native English speakers would know what I was doing, because it's a very familiar rhythmical pattern to a very familiar piece of verse, right? But uh, let's go on and have some more of them. And I won't do be so extreme now. I'll give myself the luxury of a few consonants, right? Not all the 24 consonants, I'll have half of them, or nearly half. Let's have 10 consonants, right? And these are, if you see in section 4, I'll have those 10, keep those. But, uh, and I'll keep all the intonation, and I'll, get, I'll have all the rhythm too. Only one vowel, but still, only one vowel, one vowel and 10 consonants, instead of 44 only. There is a little word, as blurred as what word is done. And every word, the bird of it, the love is yet to go. Now, love, native English speakers will recognize that. In fact, somebody probably will tell them what it is. Mary had a little lamb. Mary had a little lamb, its fleece was white as snow, and everywhere the Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. And similar kind of thing? Jug and Jill were not the old. The bush will work. Jug will do. The grub is good. A jug of double good. Anybody recognize that one? Jack and Jill. That was it. Yes. Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. That's right. And number three, another nursery rhyme. Oh, but a bird would do the good. The bush the bird do the good. But what do you do, sir? The good was bird, and so the bird did the good. That's right. Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard to fetch the poor dog a bone. Yeah. And the last, well, the last one on this side, the fourth one, is not a nursery rhyme. It's an adult poem. Very famous one. Here it is. The word is love as a blur, the blur is love, the word is love. With earth, with earth it puts, as a grew, a 
Kidley, did I? 